Hi everyone, my name's Rachel and I'm a member of the APBC. Hopefully you will all be able to hear me. So if you are one of the first people to tune in, please do pop me a little comment and let me know that you can hear me and that my microphone and everything is working okay. Today we're going to be talking about small dogs and while I just give everybody a minute to head over to the page and, and join in, we have had a couple of questions come in in advance of tonight's um, session, which is really good because it means that we can get straight into it and we can talk about small dogs for the full length of time, which is wonderful. So for those of you who haven't seen me before, I did do one of these sessions probably about a year ago now. Um, and I was talking then about pet trailing and man trailing techniques. My other love is small dogs. So I particularly like small dogs and scent work. Um, but tonight we're talking about small dogs. So I have two small dogs myself. I have Rico, who actually is his gotcha day. Um, he is a small Coconi crossbreed from the streets of Portugal. He weighs about seven kilograms at the minute. And then we have also got Maisie, who is a 10 year old Jack Russell cross pug. So she's also a small dog and she weighs around six kilograms. So both my dogs that I have, they are small dogs. Um, the vast majority of clients that I have are also small dogs. So I specialize in the small dogs and they are around kind of 15 kilograms or less. But what everybody thinks is a small dog really is open to a little bit of interpretation. So hi, Charlie. Thanks, Rosie, for letting me know you can hear me. And hi, Lee, as well, for joining in. I really appreciate it. So what I'll do is I'll start with a couple of the comments that were left on the event page. And then if there's any more, please do pop them in the chat box and I will try and come to them whilst we're doing the session as well. So one of the questions that we had that came in earlier was, are small dogs more likely to fear larger dogs? And this is really interesting because this is something I think that we maybe think we see, but it's not necessarily a true representation of how small dogs are. So there are some reasons why small dogs might become a bit more fearful, a bit more wary of larger breed dogs. And that can start from when they're really young. So I'm really lucky in my local area, we have got a wonderful dog friendly kind of coffee shop, grooming salon. It's pretty much like a dog friendly hub for our local area. And they let me run some small socialization sessions. So these were really small, well controlled. We had four members of staff, no more than 10 dogs attending at any time. And we matched the puppies who came to these sessions on age, but also on size. So we did one for the small dogs, like we're talking about this evening. And then we had one for larger breed dogs as well. And the reason that I did that and I asked the coffee shop to run it that way is because of the problems that I used to see when I was running puppy classes of dogs, particularly small dogs, who would come into their puppy training sessions, having been to a socialization session or a puppy party or some kind of group dog event, which hadn't necessarily been well managed and controlled. And the dogs have basically been allowed to run a bit riot. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the dogs were having a lovely time. But unfortunately, when you've got lots of dogs running around together and things get very excited, if you have a large breed dog, let's just say, I don't know, an Alaskan Malamute, for example, a big, fluffy, giant puppy. And we've got it in there with our tiny teacup Chihuahua or my little teacup Yorkshire Terrier client. Even if that big dog is really friendly and is really trying to put across that they are a lovely sociable dog and they're play bowing and they're doing all the right things with their body language to say that they are friendly and they're not a threat to this small dog. Actually, just their massive paw coming down on that teeny tiny puppy can actually really hurt but can also kind of leave them with this emotional side effect of being a little bit scared and a little bit wary of large dogs. And I did see this time and time again, we'd have puppies who'd come in to week one of puppy class. They'd walk in really confidently. They would be enjoying everything, able to do their training. And a couple of weeks later, they'd come back and they wouldn't want to walk into the training hall. They didn't want to come in. The brakes were on. The body language was saying, I am really quite scared and not very happy. 
and when we'd have a chat to those owners or the caregivers of those dogs to find out what had gone on it was this kind of interaction that had happened a little bit of bullying not intentional but maybe a puppy had been knocked over had been cornered by a larger dog had maybe been kind of had a larger dog leaning over the top of them and actually when they're in this socialization period and they're young and they're really learning everything about the world at that time that can be quite damaging and can leave them with some quite scary memories and thoughts about the, how interactions are going to go so we do need to be really careful on how we have our small dogs interacting with larger dogs some of the larger dogs are going to be absolutely fine to have these type of interactions and i remember having a wonderful great dane with the same class as a chihuahua and it was fabulous because the great dane was just the most adorable dog in terms of kind of lying down making itself seem small really trying to make itself suitable for play with the little chihuahua and it was letting the chihuahua climb all over it and they they played so beautifully together and it was so gentle and so relaxed it was really lovely to watch but that isn't always going to be the case because if you've got an excitable bouncy dog who just wants to have so much fun and maybe hasn't got great manners and hasn't got great social skills themselves then they can inadvertently spook our smaller dogs so we do just need to be mindful about who we're selecting for our small dogs to have as kind of play pals and um, and have these social interactions with during those formative years but also as they get older and i do see this with my two dogs themselves so Maisie is quite dog sociable i would say for a, for a 10 year old with hip dysplasia and arthritis she is quite good um however rico my other dog he has recently been diagnosed he's got sore legs he's a little bit uncomfortable with interactions with larger dogs he's all right with dogs of a similar size so if we were to bump into a jack russell on a walk yeah he's okay he'll have a little sniff and then he'll go off and do his own thing again i wouldn't say he's particularly i know he doesn't want loads of dogs friends but he tolerates them um but he he with a larger breed dog will just move out of the way and will ve give very clear body language signs of i just don't want to interact with you you know he and that's well within his right you know we wouldn't necessarily want to be friends with every single person we meet on the street and we shouldn't expect it for our dogs either okay so are small dogs more likely to fear larger dogs yes and no um i think it depends on the larger dog it also depends on the smaller dog and how these interactions are handled and how they are kind of allowed to experience that kind of social interaction if you're having rough and tumble or negative you know aversive horrible interactions with a larger dog then yeah you are going to be quite likely to develop a problem there however that is the same whether you're a small dog or you're an average sized dog it doesn't matter what size shape or breed you are you can develop issues with other dogs if you have a horrible incident happen um, but yes, I do think there are reasons for it um, and it's primarily to do with the, the kind of rough and tumble and, and accidentally getting knocked about a little bit. I just noticed a comment um, that's popped up saying, imagine if someone asked you to play rugby with someone five times your size, you'd be frightened too. I'd just be frightened of playing rugby. Wouldn't matter if they were my size or not, Rhiannon. But yeah, it's a very good point, isn't it? I think we forget sometimes that yes, although dogs are dogs, there is a huge variety in terms of kind of size, shape, breed and play styles and they're not all going to be compatible with one another. Okay, so the next question that came through prior to the session starting was one which I thought was really interesting. So if you've got any comments on this, please do pop them in the chat box for me to have a look at as well. So it said, how do we get across that a yappy, quote unquote, smaller dog is not trying to be the boss due to their size and this is something i'm really passionate about and i've done a couple of podcast episodes for various different organizations on this because this whole concept of dominance and alpha theory and oh, putting people in their place and being the boss and stuff actually so much of that has been debunked and is not what we're expecting to believe based on what's on social media okay that little dog who is being yappy um this is this is the comments words not mine okay i i don't see the small dogs as being yappy but that is the interpretation that a lot of people have of small dogs um that kind of 
they're just trying to be the boss they're trying to dominate that kind of mentality we all i think could help people to realize that that is not true um and we can just you know help to let people see that stuff that you see on social media is not always right because sadly it is one of those things where despite the fact the science telling us that you know we know now the original research that was done on this alpha wolf theory stuff is is outdated and you know was based on a um fake population of wolves in a zoo and it isn't how real wolves would interact and never mind the fact that dogs aren't wolves anyway they're so far removed from that now um but yet this kind of boss idea and dominance idea still prevails um so we do need to really try and kind of educate people that that isn't the case so i think if this is a comment in that people are saying this about your small dog then you know we can advocate for our dogs and we can try and educate other people about why our small dogs are potentially being yappy because when i go out and about with a lot of my clients and i do these sessions called um body language basics walks where i go out and i help people to identify their dog's body language in their local environment so on a normal dog walk and I go out with them and I'm, they've got this dog who maybe has this reputation of being a yappy or a reactive, um, smaller dog. And then when we go out and I see this dog and the way that they're behaving, a lot of the time the dog is reacting in that way and responding to other potentially larger breed dogs um, who are not behaving appropriately. But because their dog is quiet and not yappy, they are seen as being okay. You know, the owners think it's all right for their, let's say, Labrador to rush over to my Yorkshire Terrier client. So you've got an on lead, smaller dog who's on lead for a reason and this large dog is rushing over to it. And sure, they may not be barking and they may not be showing any overt signs of being aggressive towards the Yorkshire Terrier, but it is intimidating and it's not polite. And so actually when we look at what these yappy smaller dogs are doing, they are vocalizing and potentially expressing how they are feeling higher up on that ladder of communication or the ladder of aggression um, based on that interaction. What is being happened in that moment? What has happened to them there? And they've been trying, a lot of them are really trying our smaller dogs before they turn yappy they are showing with their body language that they are uncomfortable but whether it's because they are so small and they're so far away from us in terms of being down on the floor that we don't necessarily see it or whether this has happened for so long that some of these dogs aren't actually showing those signs anymore um a lot of their body language is missed so i will see with a lot of these smaller dogs that they will turn their head away they will avert their gaze they will lip lick they will stress yawn and they are saying as that larger dog comes towards them, they're going, oh no, I'm really not comfortable with this in any way, shape or form. But that is not kind of noticed. Nobody steps in, no one advocates for them. That larger dog doesn't get taken away, doesn't get called back. It gets allowed to come over and perpetuate the problem and intimidate this poor smaller dog. And then it's that smaller dog who goes wah, 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 and does yap to try and increase distance and say, back off, give me a little bit of space. And then it, it doesn't happen. The yappy dog gets the blame again and again and again. Um, and I do think it's a bit of a stereotype now that small dogs are yappy dogs. And they're not all. I see just as many kind of middle-sized, larger-sized dogs who are vocal as I do smaller dogs. But because they're small and they have this reputation, people are quite dismissive about it and not necessarily very pleasant about it. Um, I don't know if anybody maybe has come over from my page. I noticed there was someone um, had commented. So Lee said, hi, hi Lee. Lee said that they'd come over from my TikTok page um, to watch this tonight. And I mentioned on there yesterday that one of my clients was told by someone um, that they wouldn't work with them because the dog was basically a rat. And so we do have a lot of kind of judgment a lot of labeling around small dogs which really should be avoided where possible because they are a dog and they are just as capable and that is why i love doing scent work with small dogs because i think it is fabulous for owners i think it's fabulous for general public to see that yes 
They may be small in statute, but they are mighty. They can do so much and they are really good at scent work and sniffing and all sorts of other things as well. Um, so yeah, how do we get across that yappy smaller dogs are not trying to be the boss? I think educate, let people know that actually that your dog, potentially if this is about your dog, is feeling a little bit intimidated. Educate them if their dog is actually not behaving appropriately, if you're brave enough to. I know not everybody is quite as rude as me um, with saying to other people that their dog is not behaving appropriately because people don't want to hear it. It's a bit like I think with children. Everybody thinks their child is wonderful. Everybody thinks their dog is wonderful. But there are an awful lot of dogs out there that are not behaving appropriately and they're not helping our smaller dogs. Okay, I've just seen a comment come in here, so I'm going to come to this one next. So we've got one here which says, would you always try to avoid on-lead meetings between two dogs on a walk? Now, for me, this really does depend, okay? It depends for numerous reasons. One, I always think it depends on the individual dog. So for my dog at the minute, yes, with Rico, I tend to avoid those on-lead meetings because I know that for him, it's just not an experience he particularly wants, okay? We are working with the vet and we are on top of his pain at the minute, but at times, particularly like today, I mean, it's minus three here on the Shropshire Cheshire border at the minute, his arthritis is likely to be a little bit more uncomfortable for him, so he probably doesn't want another dog up in his face. With any dog, if people are doing on-lead meetings, I always ask people to really focus on their dog's body language when they do this and keep them very short. For me, three seconds is more than long enough, okay? Three seconds, so we're walking towards each other. If when we're coming towards each other on the walk, I see anything in my dog's body language which suggests they're not comfortable, I'm not doing it. I'm just gonna step to the side, I'm gonna say no thank you. You know, have a nice walk, whatever you need to say to get distance between you and that other dog. But I'm not going to make my dog have that interaction if they've already started to show signs of being uncomfortable. If the dogs both seem relaxed and the other owner and the other dog look sensible, then yes, I might do a three second greeting. But it really is that. And I think that's the hard part when you're working with kind of people you don't know these are people you've bumped into on the dog walk walking down the street you've potentially never met before and what can easily happen is you can get drawn into a discussion about each other's dogs we're chatting to the person we are not paying attention to our dog and when we're not paying attention to our dog that's when those interactions go on for too long we're missing that body language that says i'm uncomfortable the leads get tangled, the dogs get trapped, and we get these escalations of behavior because it's terrifying. You know, if you are a smaller dog and you're now suddenly locked with this lead of this other dog who's right in your face, that could be really, really unpleasant. So we really want to avoid those. So I do, I focus on my dog. I'm quite rude to the people. Um, I will just watch my dog. If my dog's okay, we'll do a three second sniff. And then I just say, let's go. And when my dog comes away with me, I'll give them a little treat. I'll give them a little reward, maybe give them a little stroke, tell them how amazing they've been. Um, because I want to make sure that those interactions are still positive for them. Um, so even if it's maybe been that in that moment, the dog's kind of gone, oh, we're not 100% sure. We're adding something nice into that situation afterwards so that they still hopefully find that interaction slightly better than they could have done. But yeah, if you want to avoid only greetings, that is your right. You do not have to. And I think we live in a society at the minute where everybody thinks your dog has a right to say hi to every single other dog and they just don't and they don't need to. Um, so if your dog is a dog you know struggles with social interactions and struggles with that kind of only greeting, then don't feel like you have to put yourself through it. I know sometimes it's really hard to avoid, um, but for me personally, it's a very short greeting and then I move on. Okay, a couple of other comments that have come through. So there's one here that says, I do scent work with my Chinese Crested. Although slow and steady, her confidence has grown hugely and is more tolerant of bigger dogs in the class now and can manage much better. Yes, absolutely love that. Thank you so much for sharing. So that is exactly why I love doing things like scent work with smaller dogs particularly like the pet trailing side, and I don't know if you've come across that, um, but when we're doing pet trailing, the dog is following a scent trail of another dog, and when they're doing that, they're obviously learning about that dog the whole time. They're picking up all that information without having to have those on-lead, face-to-face, uncomfortable interactions. 
And then when they do find the other dog, they get a really high value reward at a safe distance. And actually that has worked wonders for my personal dog, Rico, as well, because um, he could be a little bit wary after a, an unfortunate incident with a larger dog. And we've been pet trailing with some of the biggest German Shepherds I've ever seen. And he doesn't bat an eyelid now, whereas previously he would have been unhappy and he would have been snarling, barking, lunging. All the things that I'm sure nobody expects as a behaviorist me to be saying that my dog does. But yes, we have reactive dogs too and we understand. So it happens, you know, it doesn't matter what you do for a job. You can end up with these problems with your dogs. But scent work, fabulous, and it really does boost confidence. Okay, so Lee's popped a comment in here saying that um, their dog, Ellie's arthritis was bad today with the cold weather. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it, for them at the minute, bless them. We've just got to do our best to try and keep them warm. Okay, um, so what you were saying about doing training, we do find the biscuits in the park. I throw it and say find it to use her brain and smell on walks to keep her brain active and mix up her walks. Perfect. And so that's the kind of thing where I think with some of our small dogs, one of the things that people tend to do is we because they are smaller and they are manageable we pick them up and we avoid situations and yes that can be a management strategy but it is not necessarily going to get them to be more confident like these two examples of scent work that people have mentioned so i think one of my things when i'm working with a small dog that i particularly like is to give the dog that confidence back and for people to start working with that dog and respecting that dog like it is a larger dog because just because you can do something to a dog based on its size does not mean you should and i think we lose a lot of respect for our smaller dogs you know we scoop them up we kind of pin them down and put whatever we want onto them and all of these things um because we can because we get away with it um and actually that's really detrimental to them in terms of them having any element of kind of um, control, cooperation in their care practices. And just because you can do something, you shouldn't necessarily. All right, so we had another quite a long message come through prior to tonight's session. So I'm not going to read it word for word um, because I would struggle to, I think. Um, I've got my glasses on, but I'd be looking at all the other screens and everything. So we had a question come in from Maggie. So thank you, Maggie, for getting in touch about this and for letting us know about the situation with your dog. So Maggie sent through, and this is just a short version of what she said. She's got a three-year-old Bichon, and for the last 18 months, unfortunately, her dog has been biting. Now, what I think is particularly interesting about the information that Maggie has provided is that she has mentioned specifically that when this dog was a puppy at 10 weeks of age, a rather large gentleman leant over the fence and there was quite a scary, intimidating incident with some shouting and, and um, kind of just not being very pleasant, this gentleman. Um, and it has obviously really scared the dog. Now, I think sometimes this is, it's, important to be aware of that we can have triggering factors for when dogs develop behavioral problems now in these sessions like this tonight i can't give specific behavior advice for an individual dog okay and there's there's many reasons for that but primarily from a safety perspective because i don't have all the information i need to make an informed decision on on things and we work as many of you'll know if you're following the apbc page we are working off vet referral. And although the, the notes for this dog specifically said there's no health conditions, I would still need that approval from the vet, okay? And I would still want to see the medical history before I gave specific advice. But if we look at these type of situations, okay? Triggering factors and that are happening at that time period are happening during that formative socialization window. So socialization, I think, is a bit of a buzzword in dog kind of the dog world at the minute. Socialization, socialization, socialization. And what people mean by socialization varies quite a lot. And it is something that actually with our small dogs, we really do need to get right. We need to get it right with every dog. But I see it going wrong with a lot of smaller dogs. One we talked about earlier in terms of kind of social interactions with other dogs and kind of bullying um, and dogs getting knocked about a bit and being a bit intimidated by other larger dogs at those type of events. But the other one is with these encounters with people. Because our small breed dogs are exceptionally cute as puppies and they are so tiny, people have a tendency, sometimes meaning to, sometimes not meaning to, 
to get very over the top of these dogs and get very in their space. And again, I think it comes down to the fact that we can and you tend to get away with it. And I really wish that people weren't doing that because actually just because they're tiny doesn't mean that it's okay to just like lean over. Imagine how scary that must be if you have a massive hand coming right towards you. Terrifying, okay? Um, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be allowing the dog to participate of their own free will in those type of interactions. Now, in this specific example that Maggie's given us about her little dog, um, that sounds like it wasn't something she had any control over. You know, they were outside, somebody's leant over the fence and there's been a really scary incident. And at 10 weeks of age, we are in that socialization window and dogs are making new connections in their brains so rapidly, so fast at that point. And what may well have happened is that kind of any sudden movement, any kind of appearing out of, out of nowhere for this dog is now a trigger. So when Maggie wrote in, she mentioned that the dog has bitten again um, and has bitten a few times and that can seemingly come from nowhere. And what a lot of the time we need to do when I'm working with dogs like this is we really need to build a bit of emotional resilience, a bit of confidence in them to be able to tolerate things appearing kind of suddenly. And that's not easy. It's a very slow process. And it is something where you're best working alongside a, a full APBC member who's maybe local to you to support you with that because everybody has a startle reflex. All of our dogs have a startle reflex. You know, if something fell over outside my house right now and there was a big bang, I'd probably jump and, and get a bit of a shock. But that level of response, if you've had time and time again, things happen to you that have been scary, then those dogs are more likely to go in at the top end. So rather than, you know, the way I jumped and kind of woo, at the scary noise, they might just snap straight away. So getting them down from that can take quite a bit of time and it can be quite hard. But we've always got to be mindful that when we've got a situation with a dog who is biting, that obviously there's a safety component here. And so sometimes what we need to do is put in place lots of management based stuff first and foremost. So if things, if we look at maybe keeping a diary, if, if anybody's having issues with their dog, regardless of size, you know, what are the triggers? What are the situations in which these things are occurring? Because sometimes there are patterns that we're not aware of. To give you an example, I've been walk, working with a small dog recently. And when I did their initial consult, I was jotting down a little bit of a timeline of events of things that had happened. And every single incident had occurred when the dog had been asleep on the sofa. So yes, we can do work around that and we can do training around that, but there is a much easier management-based solution for that, which is that we don't let the dog fall asleep on the sofa. Because if someone was leaning over to pick up the remote, if someone stood up off the sofa, any kind of movement or change, even when the dog was asleep, they were waking up and they were snapping and they were biting straight away. So if we want to keep everybody safe, one of the easiest solutions is that we just don't let the dog do that, okay? We just say, right, if the dog is tired and the dog wants to rest somewhere, they rest in their dog bed and everybody keeps their distance from there, okay? We no longer have them lying on the sofa next to us because it isn't safe, okay? That is absolutely in no way me saying that dogs are not allowed on the sofa. I'd be exceptionally hypocritical because both of my small dogs do. Okay, it's your house, your rules. It's entirely what works best for you. Um, but we've just got to be mindful that sometimes we are putting ourselves and our dogs in situations that aren't particularly helpful. Okay, so triggering events are things that we can look out for when we're working with a behavior case, irrespective of size of dog. And actually when we have these kind of things that happen, if something scary happens during their young kind of formative period, we really do want to work on that there and then, okay? What we don't wanna do is be leaving this until there is a problem and then seeking support. And unfortunately that is what myself and I'm sure many of my colleagues see time and time again, is that people wait until things have got to being really bad and we've had a bite before we do anything about it. So we are coming to the end of today's session, but I'm happy to take some more questions if there are any. So I think I've covered everything that's come through so far, but if anybody else is watching and you've got any questions, please do pop them in. More than happy to take them. So we've talked about on lead greetings. We've had a little bit of a chat about scent work, which I always like. 
but if there are any more, do pop them in for me now. Whilst you're doing that, I'm just going to um, tell you a little bit about um, something that I think is relevant in terms of small dogs. So when um, a while ago, I was asked to write an article about small dogs for a magazine. OK, and I was asked if small dog syndrome is a thing. OK, is small dog syndrome a thing? And again, it comes back to this reputation that small dogs have. OK, a lot of people see them as yappy. A lot of people see them as being kind of naughty um, and it's about how we're interacting with these dogs. So if you're a small dog owner and you're watching this or you're thinking of getting a small dog, then please do just keep in mind that at the end of the day, they are a dog. And so just because you can do something with them because they're small, like pick them up and move them, OK, or put them somewhere doesn't mean that you should. Okay. We should be working with these dogs in the same way that we do with our larger dogs who you could not physically move and pick up and get to do things. We should be using our reward based training. You know, we don't need to physically manipulate our dogs to do anything, whether it's sit down, stand, paw, roll over, whatever it is. You don't need to push and kind of physically manipulate your dog to do any of those things. You can use lures, you can use shaping techniques, you can get those behaviours without touching your dogs. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. All right. I've noticed there's a couple of comments that have come in now. So I will cover this one tonight before we finish. Um, there's one here and I don't, it's not necessarily a small dog thing. Um, it's just a dog thing. So how do you stop puppies from chewing? Well, my answer to that is going to be you don't. Okay. Because puppies need to chew. All right. So puppies and actually dogs of all ages will chew things. It's a natural innate behavior for our dogs. What we're best to do, rather than thinking about stopping it, is providing safe, appropriate outlets for our puppies to do this on. So puppies in particular, like the comment has mentioned, they may well be teething. OK, so if they're teething, they've potentially got a little bit of pain while teeth are coming through. It's a bit uncomfortable and chewing on something helps relieve that pressure. So that is already going to make it quite difficult for you to get that puppy to stop chewing things because it feels good when they do it. So it's rewarded as soon as it happens. So what you want to do is be making sure that your puppy is not doing that on something they shouldn't be. So have a look at the things they are choosing to chew. If they're chewing your chair legs, if they're chewing your skirting boards and things that are wood, then what I personally always suggest to clients is that they find something of a similar texture for the dog to chew on. So things like your Anko tree roots, your olive tree roots that have a similar give, they're quite a nice outlet for them. But even something like a carrot is a nice thing for a dog to chew on. OK, there's plenty of options if they're chewing something that is plastic. So if they're picking up a TV remote, for example, because they're exploring the world with their mouth at this age, then I would find something similar again, like a puppy dog toy, one of the like harder toys for them to chew on. So they've got that similar texture to kind of match and, and interact with with chewing and mouthing. There can be a link with puppies being overtired, so make sure they're getting the right amount of sleep. I think sometimes people are surprised that they do need kind of 18 to 20 hours of sleep a night. So really make sure that they're getting enough sleep. Make sure they've got appropriate outlets of things to chew rather than thinking of trying to stop something that they're just going to naturally do. All right, Karen, hopefully that helps you. Um, I'm just going to double check if we've got any more Um Oh, that's lovely. So Lee's just mentioned that their dog is really chilled out with big and small dogs. Even with Great Dane, she's happy around one and has one as a friend. Thank you. That's really nice of you to share. And I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Hopefully that has been helpful for you. Um, with At the end of the day, the vast majority of the stuff for the small dogs does apply to our other dogs too. OK, but we just have to not necessarily wrap our small dogs up in cotton wool and bubble wrap. We just have to really look at what interactions we're letting them have and letting them have control and respecting their decisions and their wishes on things. Because when we don't and we force our dogs to do things, that's when we can create conflict and things can become more challenging for them and for us. All right. Hopefully you found that useful. I'm sure we will have another one of these sessions very soon for you and the recording will be available after tonight's session for you to watch back if you've just joined us and caught only the end. 
My name's Rachel. I'm full member of the APBC. You can find me at Nose to Trail. And if you've got any questions, do pop them in the comments. If you, if you put hashtag replay or something, I will try and keep an eye on those over the coming weeks as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.